Hey, my name is Carl Murphy. I'm the president and co-founder of Get Spiffy, and this is Inside Voices, Career Paths at Spiffy, where we're interviewing uh, successful members of our team uh, to give a better understanding of people considering joining our team, what it's like to be at Spiffy and what career opportunities exist here. Today, I'm interviewing Kevin Dooley. Kevin is the regional manager for the Southeast. He owns uh, a swath of territory, including North Carolina, uh, Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Texas. Uh, we have interesting geographic alignments here. Uh, we can tell you about that again at another podcast. Uh, Kevin, welcome. How are you doing, buddy? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Hey, so let's start with uh, where did Kevin Dooley grow up and what was life like before you got to Spiffy and, and where'd you come from and how, how'd you find your way here? So actually was born in Florida, Sunrise, Florida. Um, moved here when I was about 11 years old. My dad had a good job opportunity. So we actually moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, lived there for about two years. And I've spent the remaining 25 years in Concord, North Carolina. Wow. I didn't know you were a Concord veteran. Interesting. <laughs> uh, and so you joined Spiffy in 16? 2018. 2018. Okay. 2018. What were you doing before? So, so you get out of, you go to high school in Concord, you leave Concord. What, what'd you do after that? Talk, talk to me about high school to Spiffy. So right out of high school, I ended up joining, um, auto bell car wash. That was one of my first real big career paths. Um, accidentally fell into management. My, my old roommate was a manager for him and he had a guy that he had to demote and they ended up getting rid of. So he said, Hey, you know, you're already working here. What do you think about management? So fell into management when I was around 19, worked there for about three years. And then I joined Cookout, which is a fast food restaurant chain throughout kind of the South, Southeast. And I worked for them for almost 11 years. Uh, started off as just an assistant manager, bottom of the, the barrel manager and worked my way up to a general manager within about nine months. Worked for him for probably about three and a half years before I actually got promoted to a district manager. Had to move to Georgia and open the first six locations in Georgia from Milledgeville to Atlanta, uh, to Statesboro. So it was kind of all over the place. And then ended up moving back to North Carolina and finished the rest of my career out with them in North Carolina. Yeah. And you did a lot of like, uh, for a while, didn't you do like the fix the cookout? Fix the, fix the bad restaurant missions. Yes. So after I moved back to North Carolina, they, they kind of put me in charge of making sure that health inspections were going, you know, proper, making sure that all the standards are in place, temperatures, going back in, training managers, helping GMs kind of get their food costs down, their labor down and really just grinding out the numbers. And I would go in for probably about two to three months and then they'd be like, Hey, here's another location. Here's another one. So I, I did that roughly for probably about two and a half years before I stepped back into the role of a general manager again, and did that for about another two years and then ended up coming to Spiffy. Yeah. So if you, if you're not familiar, if you're not listening from the Southeast and you've never been to a cookout, there is absolutely a gap in your culinary experience as a human. <laughs> Cookouts are pretty awesome. They have great hamburgers, but they actually have even better shakes. Um, and so should you find yourself in close proximity to a cookout, I would walk over there and give them 20 bucks for at least a shake and a burger. Uh, uh, I get, I get distracted by that. It's, it's an awesome product. <laughs> what is this? It's an awesome product. Like there's like, you know, there's so much, there's so much restaurant in America, but like some just stand out. Like I think like cookout and Chick-fil-A to me are special, you know, I mean, you gotta they be figured it out. out. Yeah. It's like, it's in, in the grand world of all these, uh, food restaurant, fast food restaurants, fast casual, whatever it might be. They've really dialed that in. Um, so, Hey, tell me about what it's like to go fix a, like a broken restaurant. When you show up, talk to me about the leadership component of it and talk to me about like the tasks and yeah, give me some stories on that. I think people would be really interested to see what that's like or hear what that's like. You know, first things first, obviously meeting the staff and really checking out the facility. It always started with an early morning visit before the staff gets there, really see how the managers really set up the place. You know, mm -hmm. you walk around your coolers. If you tell that there's obviously some old food on the floor, you have stuff that might be out of date by one or two days. And I will honestly say that 
their policies pretty heavy when it does come to the actual quality of their product. So, right. you know, don't get me wrong. Meat doesn't sit there for longer than two days and it actually gets delivered every single day. Yeah. So you go and they well, grinder, so they, they grinder on meat, don't they? Isn't that one of the things that's true? Is that they have their own meat packing or not packing. In every they, state, they actually have at least one or two facilities. And they have about three to four assets that they send out every morning starting at 3 a.m. to go drop off meat at every single one of their yeah, if, if you're not from Spiffy, an asset is a vehicle. It's a van or a truck. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's completely corrupted by Spiffy lingo. By Spiffy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And, and then once you get in there, you know, you got to check your product. You got to check everything that you have going on. And, you know, it's just really feeling the energy from any, like any management position. You know, you got to feel the energy from your staff. Do these people have fans? Do they want to work for them? What do they like about working for them? And, you know, body language tells everything. And you just right. spend the, really yeah. the first day, actually first week with the management team. You might go in there and open. You might go in there and work three o'clock in the afternoon to about four o'clock in the morning. That's typically yeah. their busiest time. Yeah. And you just check quality. You're checking temperatures and you're checking the cleanliness of everything and, and making sure that they are on standard. Yeah. Temperature. You don't want temperature in the refrigerator. You don't want temperature of the food coming out like the hamburger. Everything. Food. Everything. So yeah. their coolers, you know, obviously freezers have to be a certain temp. Their walk-in coolers have to be a certain temp. You know, the chili's got to be. The one thing I can say about cookout was your typical standard temperature of your poultry, your pork, whatever. They always wanted it to be at least four degrees hotter than your, than your standard. When it comes to health inspections, what from a cook standpoint, like after I cooked it, or are you talking about you're talking about in the in the in the refrigerator? No, I'm talking about cooking wise. Yeah, and of course, even their coolers, they always wanted it to be four degrees colder. colder. Than it was yeah. expected. Yep. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Well, we have that too. Like you know, we have generally really good operations at Spiffy, but every now and then a city goes sideways, and oh, uh, Kevin knows this. A lot of people don't. You know, my my. uh my inspection strategy to show up on Sunday afternoon because, you know, Sunday between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. is, is in, in, in the best operating cities, it's the low point of your operations. And so whatever that looks like, it only gets better from there. So it's a good sort of baseline. Um, and, and we do the same thing, right? We look at the cleanliness of trucks. So is the outside of the truck clean? Is the inside of the truck clean? You know, clearly people are using the trucks, the tools that are in a tool bag. It's, you know, if you're on the mechanic, you sort of, uh, you don't know what organized looks like, but our, you know, our good mechanics have their tools organized that, you know, the wrenches and the sockets and the screwdrivers all together and they can like reach over like a doctor and pull it out. Right. There's, there's no, you know, we, you know, there's oil spillage, like it's just part of the job and, and we provide lots of tools to clean up oil and spills. And so like, look, it shouldn't be on the ground for more than five minutes. So you got f five drops of oil turns into a slip or five drops of oil turns into 50 drops, turns into like a mess. And so, you know. Is that stuff being cleaned up by end of shift? Is it being cleaned up immediately or is it not? And, and that, you know, the other thing too, it's interesting you say, like, you just look at people, you know, do they have a spring in their step? They make eye contact with you. They come in, you know, I walk into some places and I get high fives, right? Like, Hey Murph, what's going on? You get a high five, right? <laughs> From like, a, you know, and, and we have all these training videos, like the, the employees are definitely at an advantage because they've seen me before I see them in most cases, we have like 600 employees and they get like a culture pitch from me and a couple of other videos that are pre-recorded and you know i didn't i didn't necessarily meet them it's like hey mr murphy how you doing and so but it's it's you know do you have the positive experience or does everybody scurry like rats when you turn the lights on you know um yep. unfortunately you and i have had both those experiences in our, our time <laughs> together um okay so so you're a you're a you're a car wash guy turned fast food restaurant workout area manager, district manager, problem solver. And then you come to Spiffy. That's right. Right. You came to us from cookout, right? Yes, sir. And so, so what attracted you to Spiffy and, and what was that like at first? We, you got hired in to be the GM of Charlotte, right? Correct. Um, you know, honestly looking online, I, I was actually searching for jobs for a while. Um, I will say I was, I was burned out, um, working. 13, 14 hour days consistently yeah. and your days off start at six o'clock in the morning and you have to be back at work the next morning by six o'clock AM. Right. Um, you spend the so, whole day, just, you spend the whole day doing laundry and sleeping, right? Sleeping. Yeah, pretty much. 
you know? Um, so I, I just needed a better lifestyle, you right. know? And, Cause you were married you know, at that I'll, point, right? You were married. Yep. Yeah, married. And, and I, I will definitely say my wife kind of like nudged me a little bit, maybe, a, maybe a foot to the chest, a get out. Um, and I found Spippy and I've always been, itched. I always loved the car wash. And I remember, heck, even interviewing with you, I brought up, you know, car wash lingo of cars per man and your chemical costs and everything else. And that's just always something that stuck with me. And once I went through the interview process, I thought it was really good. I remember Chris Cerati, Scott Crystal, um, the original team interviewed me, all the GMs. And, and then I made it through a couple old older VPs back in the time. And, and then I made it with you. Um, and I wouldn't, wouldn't turn back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks for joining. You've done a great job for us. So, so what was it like coming into Spiffy, like on, you know, day one, week one, month one, um, what were your, what, what were your memories of that? And what were, uh, sort of the lessons learned from that, that time period for you? It was a shock. <laughs> I remember training in Raleigh for two weeks and I know that Charlotte needed help and there wasn't really much leadership there. Right. So I remember showing up first day. I remember the first person I met was actually Chris Marshall. He was standing at the door waiting for me to come in. Right. And he said, Hey, we need to write next week's schedule. And I was like, okay, <laughs> Look, that's a, that's a heck of a way of an introduction. Then he gave me a quick tour of the shop and everything else. And, you know, coming from cookout, I was used to working those 12, 13, 14 hour days. So, and, and Chris, Chris was the supervisor in Charlotte at the time, right? He was a technician. He was a technician. He was a technician. And, you know, I remember he said, look, I'm going to shadow you for your first couple of days. I want to make sure that you're good to go. I want you, I want to introduce you to the team. And, and I said, I really appreciate that. Um, cause the other manager happened to be off and. I just remember showing up, you know, back in our heavy RSL days, we'd show up at six o'clock in the morning, sometimes five 45 to make sure those texts are getting in there and getting out late. And mm -hmm. I remember him at the end of the night, you know, might've been five thirty, six o'clock. Like, are you going home? I said, no. He said, why? And I was like, it's still early. You know, I'm used to getting home <laughs> late. It's okay. And he looked at me, he's like, you're gonna get burned out. I was like, oh, this is, this is nothing. I said, try working 3 a.m or 3 right. p.m. to, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. So it's a, it's a right. little bit different. And, you know, it was just really, the first thing I did was get to know the tax. And I, I was a little bit confused, obviously still new at it. So just randomly show up at an appointment and say, hey guys, you know, what's going on? What can you teach me today? What can I, what can I help you? Right. And, you know, just going in and really meeting the tax, you know, I would say after the first week, after the first two weeks and, just started following in and, and then, you know, getting used to the, the different system of RSLs and, you know, back then, of course, we didn't have high volume oil changes and everything else. So it was mostly consumer washes, making sure you were taking care of all the RSLs and you barely had any B2C business. I remember B2C business then was, you know, a couple hundred bucks a day. Look at us now. Right. Uh, and it, it just took a little bit to get used to, but you know, I would say after my first probably 30 days, I, I really started getting the swing of things. Yeah. So, um, let me, uh, provide translation services for those people who are not inside Spiffy and listening to this, um, RSLs is office buildings. Uh, it's, it's an acronym that stands for recurring service location. And we built this whole system around how to identify, um, different parts of what you as a, as a non spiffy person would consider an office building, right? There's, there's parking lots, there's uh, client office buildings. We have these uh, little mailboxes where we would exchange keys with the customer securely. Um, there's wash sites and there's places we can't wash. And so, you know, you could imagine, you know, a lot of office buildings, especially in the Southeast, there are these suburban office parks that are, you know, five, three to five story buildings that are like 200,000 square feet. There could be one to 20 in an office park, right? And, and we, we would contract with the property management team to be approved to service them. And then we would go introduce ourselves to the tenants and then 
we, you know, some places we could wash, you know, like if there's 20 buildings, you couldn't generally wash at 20, you could wash at sort of like five and you had to figure that out. And so we built this whole system around it and we called it uh, RSL management system and it integrated with our software. And so, you know, Kevin's old school about that. He was there when we built it. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, blood, sweat, and tears in that system. The other thing is B to, so, so our lines of business, so Kevin talked about high volume oil, B to C. So we have consumer business, right? That's B to C. That's, we go to your house, right? You're like one person, you live in a neighborhood. We come out and clean your car, detail your car, change your oil. Then there's RSLs where we actually service consumers at their office building, right? And so that's like business to, it's like B to B to C. So business to business to consumer. And then there's um, straight up B2B or fleet business was what we call it. And, and around 2019, we started doing a lot of fleet business and what we call high volume oil. It's not actually high volume oil. It's high volume oil change or it's, it's a, it's a lot of cars, right? So when the technician shows up, there's basically just like a parking lot of vehicle that needs service from us. So they're, they basically drive one place. They get there in the morning, six, seven, eight o'clock. It varies. And then they're there all day for their eight hour shift. And they're generally changing oil, inspecting tires, sometimes putting tires on, uh, mobily. Um, they could be doing detailing, they could be doing cleaning. Um, now, and now we do a lot of maintenance. I mean, you can be doing brakes, uh, alternators, batteries. I and mean, we do sort of, I mean, we've done transmissions in, in the field. And so there's this whole range of stuff, uh, backup cameras, side mirrors, like if you can imagine a delivery van, you know, look at them driving through your neighborhood. I'm telling you, like once a day, one of them is banged up a little bit and, and it's going to land in front of, in front of my, one of our technicians or, or one of our competitors technicians, and they're going to get it fixed because those, those brands, uh, that are doing delivery for you, they don't, they don't want those vans to be beat up. One, there's a safety component to it. Like they need side mirrors to drive safely. And then two, it just, you know, if, if you're a company. Right. You don't, you don't want all your trucks to look like they've been through a demolition derby and, and certainly some of them do. <laughs> so that provides a lot of business for us. So, so that's, so we talked about RSLs, B2C, business consumer, high volume oil. And I think if, if you're a, if you're a recruiter, you're an employee or a potential uh, person joining our team, those things are important because, um, you know, when you first come to Spiffy and correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, this, this may have changed. It's, it's really not something that I spend a lot of time with today, but. We like to put a, a new technician in a, in a single line of business and to get them good at that. Right. So it's like, if we're going to hire you, you know, into a B2C route, like, you know, we're going to hire you to go to Concord. You're going to drive from our warehouse to Concord, you know, every day of the week, you're going to drive to North Charlotte to the communities that are up there and you're going to serve consumers every day of the week. And you're going to do wash detail, oil change, those sorts, whatever our consumers are buying from us, because then you know, and it takes probably 60 days to become really proficient. And we train you in two weeks. And then it's sort of like two weeks, you're like sort of an apprentice sort of under the scope, under the microscope of the management team. And then like month two, you're really building your skill set up and you're getting efficient. And, and really by about like day 60 or 75, you're like in the groove, right? And, and you sort of got it down. You've seen a lot of different types of vehicles. You've sort of seen every problem you might have, whether it's dog hair, vomit, uh, scratches, whatever those things might be. Right. Is that, is that an accurate description or am I making those things up? No, very accurate. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, you showed up at Spiffy, um, you met Chris Marshall, uh, you know, interesting side note, uh, Chris Marshall, you know, so this is 2018, right? You joined, is that right? Yes, 2018. Sir. So Chris Marshall is a technician in 2018. He's now general manager, no area manager of our largest city by dollars, right? He runs Atlanta now. Um, so we're going to interview Chris later in the series, but he uh, was a technician in Charlotte, became a supervisor in Charlotte, right? You promoted him and trained him. And then he went to DC, right? Spent a year or two yep, up in DC. Washington, DC. Spent about a year and a half there. Yep. Opened up our DC market for us. And then, uh, and that was a smaller market to start. And then um, opportunity came available and in Atlanta and he moved down there and he's just, he's, he's thriving down there. It's awesome. Chris will be an interesting story because he, 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 I think he struggled on the management side at, at first, you know, but, um, he, he's, he's drank the Kool-Aid now. <laughs> yes. Yes. He's not so much hands-on anymore, which is good. Especially yeah. when you have a city that goes to the size of it. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. So talk about that. So talk about that for technicians. So I think one of the things you talked about earlier, if you come to work for us, you have to expect to see a lot of management in the field, right? So you're going to be in the field, your supers are going to be in the field, your GMs, you're going to see me in the field sometimes. And, and then, um, uh, yeah, so we have that field leadership, um, but there's this balance. So talk about the balance of like, I, I want to go to the field and, and be in touch and be empathetic and understand my guy's skill set. But then like if I'm, I, there's only so much impact I can have doing that. Talk, talk about that a little bit. I would say the times that we do spend in the field is probably the most impact. You know, obviously you're going to go visit, you're going to, you're going to go see your good technicians. You're going to check up on them, but those aren't the guys that you're really trying to impact in the field. You're going to, of course, you're going to make sure that they're following the process, but the guys with maybe you know, spiffy with the consumer technicians, we have a power score that rates their, their ratings to the services. You know, if you go out and you have some of your low power score technicians, those are the guys you want to go out in the field with and, and really get down and dirty with them. You want to show them different techniques on vacuuming. You want to show them little tips and tricks that you can pull with a vacuum with pet hair or, or any of the things that they could be struggling with. And those are the times that we we need to focus on that are out in the field now don't get me wrong there's other times that we're making impacts of going and seeing a customer and even introducing some of our high volume oil technicians to a new manager that just came in or making sure that you're doing your inspections you know atlanta is a a massive city you know i will use this as an example because i had it for two years and you have several fixed sites, which are, we show up, we don't have to send an asset there. We have our own equipment there that enterprises allowed us to store there and help them out. And you still have to go see those, you know, an airport. Atlanta has one of the busiest airports in the United States. And the amount of traffic that, that goes through there, that's, that's a huge center for our business in Atlanta. And you got to show up there two or three days a week. You got to go check yeah. in on your guys. You, you know, even if you're running third shift. Yeah. So, up, yeah. So let, 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 let me pause you a second. So, so we're on, we, we run three shifts a day, seven days a week. Right. And, and that's, uh, that's just you, something you need to know. We, we work outside. Um, so we do some, well, Kevin mentioned fixed sites. So there are places, you know, we're, we're primarily a mobile business, but, um, we do a lot of work at what we call fixed sites. Right. And that is. Um, you know, it could be anything from, you know, uh, an empty building that has, we put supplies in to a full fledged repair shop that has lifts and air compressors and, and, um, storage and tires and air conditioning and, um, uh, you know, alignment racks and sort of welders and all this sort of stuff. Right. So we have this, imagine like the most Mac daddy newest and sophisticated repair shop to like literally a field. In some cases, we put shipping containers there because they're super secure. So if we're going to be there a long time, we'll drop either a 20 or 40 foot shipping container with supplies in there and you operate there. And so um, it's been something we've done to, to help our customers in some cases, um, to get more coverage, to be more efficient, those sorts of things. Um, hey, the other thing you mentioned is power score. So this is important. If you're uh, coming on board as an employee, manager, technician, anybody, we're very data driven. It's some, it's a component of our culture that we find really important. We like, we like to take, we like to collect as much data as possible and make decisions with data. And one of those things we do, right? So every consumer service is what we call um, rate gated. So the customer has to rate the service before they can pay. And we did that intentionally because we want them to rate the service. Uh, and so we get a, a ton of ratings and a ton of feedback on employees. And as a rule across the company, you know, so they rate, they rate us one to five stars, one being bad, five being awesome, three being in the middle average. And we're at 4.8 out of five, basically across, across the entire company. And it goes up and down a little bit, but we take those ratings and then we, we input those into a proprietary calculus formula and you get a, a number from, you know, zero to 110 or something. Right. And we call that the power score. And it's really an indicator of how much work the employee has done that week. And then um, what their ratings are as measured by the customer, right? So it's cool because it's completely driven by you, the employee and the customer. So, and, and we, again, another cultural component of our business is customer first, right? So customer rates of service, you produce the capacity of work, 
And then we give you a number from zero to 105 or 106. And uh, sort of like, you know, over 90 is good. 80 to 90, like you're okay, average. Below 80, you're on a list. And Kevin talked about that. Like, you know, you're below 80, like you can expect more supervision and more inspection because there's really no reason for it, for you to have those those lower scores, right, in most cases. Um, so we want to, you know, and Kevin talked about like, we have employees that, you know, so every one of our services has a time spec, right? So, uh, you know, our, our Spiffy service is like, call it 60 minutes. We have some employees that can do that service in 30 minutes and get five-star ratings. And we have employees that take 90 minutes to do that and, and get three-star or two-star ratings, right? And it's almost, it's almost uh, oddly, um, uh, it's an odd sort of illogical fact that the employees who take longer get lower ratings. Like you'd think the more time would get, you get a better rating, but it's really indicative of they don't really know what they're doing. They don't know how to use the tools. They don't know what customers are looking for. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, can you hear that stuff, Kevin, mm -hmm. in the background or no, Can you hear that you can't hear the guy who's got like a weed whacker and a chainsaw next to me. <laughs> no, there's nothing in the background. All right, Chad, but if you can cut that out, I'd appreciate it. But like the landscapers next door showed up and they're running every power tool they can, like, like five feet away from me. And they're looking at me like it's, Hey, we got to work too, dude. So, okay. Back. So, so power scores, um, you know, completely controlled by the employee, driven by time spec. And it's interesting. It's, it's again, odd that it takes longer. They get lower scores. The, the most efficient technicians produce the most amount of work and have the best ratings. And it's really, do you know how to use the tools we have, right? Do you know how to use an air gun to be faster? Do you know how to get dog hair out? Um, you know, we, we hire some people. It's just, there's this weird thing where guys will, oh, I'm going to use this. This is my, this is my vacuum, right? And and they're like, they're hitting the floor with it, right? Like you ever see, I, I love, you can see this at a hundred yards, like they're vacuuming like this. I'm like, dude, that it's, we're not hitting the floor. We're like, drop it, move it across, right? And and the vacuum like has power. If it doesn't pick it up, I'm like, dude, two swipes and it's either coming up or it's not. Well, what if it's not coming up? Well, you can use an air gun, then air gun it out. What if it's not coming up? Well, then you need like, a pumice tool or we have all these hand tools to get stuff up or it's not coming out. Like there's sort of like, you know, three levels of vacuum it, air gun it, pick it out with your finger or like, we're not going to get it done. Right. Or I guess we can go to shampoo, but so there's all these things that drive productivity. And, um, I'll tell you as a new employee, what I see is if you're open to learning, like we can teach you how to be better. If you show up and think, you know what you're doing, cause like you think you're a detailer from, auto bell or some car wash company or some other detail company, you know, we're going to teach you how to be faster. Um, because it's interesting. Our technicians, um, generate somewhere between two and four times revenue, the, uh, as much two to four times more revenue than the average industry metrics. And, and some of it's sales and marketing, some of it's tech, you know, tools and techniques, and some of it's just great training. Right. And, and you know, guys like Kevin, the process, it is the process, right. But it's, you got to, if you're joining the company, you got to like submit to the process or you're going to submit to the Employment Security Commission and go make a career <laughs> somewhere else. Uh, sorry. Okay. Kevin and I have a lot of experience with that, with others. Okay. So we talked about power score and fixed sites. Um, so, so how long did it take you to become what you felt was comfortable and proficient as a general manager? I said probably about 90 days, at least 90 days. Um, you know, and, and I feel like I came in at a time, it was November, 2018, 2019 is when we really started pushing high volume. Um, and so I kind of came in at the beginning of us continuously climbing and adding new services. So I kind of felt like I was there for the beginning of some of it. Yep. Um, and then. You know, once we threw high volume mix into it, you know, late 2019, early 2020, it was up. Oh, this is a whole new ball game. And then we really had to start paying attention to the money. We had to pay attention to like, like what is the, you know, the cost of goods of this versus the regular detail stuff mm -hmm. of what we were doing. Um, yeah. and I would say for me to really, really get well, I mean, it took me probably about at least, at least a year. Yeah. Of just growing and, and seeing all the new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say it's 90 days to like 
you know what you need to do every day. And it, and then it's another six to nine months to like, I got this. Like yep. it takes, you know, again, it depends on your city and it depends on the, the dynamic of what's going on there. Are you growing? Is it, is it a stable city that's you know, sort of grown a little bit or is it on this like really steep curve of growth? Um, those sort of drive different, different sort of challenges for the GM. Um, so you do a lot of, so let's transition to technicians, right? You do a lot of hiring for the company. Um, what do you see as the key qualities of our most successful technicians? And what are you, what are you looking for when you're interviewing someone? I'd say I look for someone with the energy in a contagious smile, especially when it comes to customers. If somebody's happy, if someone, you can tell they're just a pleasant person. Those are the kind of people that you want in front of a customer. You don't want a guy that's very short and just a little off. It's never going to work. It, it won't. And even with our, our major fleet customers, uh, I've had that experience in several cities. You know, you have to be willing. You have to be coachable. If you're not coachable, you already said this earlier. If you want to learn, we can teach you. If you follow the process, you're going to be successful. You go outside of outbounds of that, it, it might not work. Um, but you have to have energy. This is a this is a job that we work outside. You know, sometimes we might work in the rain. Sometimes we've worked in sleet. We have worked when it's cold. And if, if you don't bring the energy and you don't bring that willingness to push yourself through it, you will not make it. Yeah, you got you got to be an optimist who wants to win. Because um, again, we culturally and uh someone asked me this question you know what do i look for in managers and i'm like look i want somebody who wants to be elite right like you got to show up every day and you want to deliver the best you can deliver if you're looking to you know work 40 hours a week and collect a paycheck this is the antibodies at spiffy will reject you very quickly you know you will be you'll be vomited out of the system like nobody's business um because we're growing fast and we have very high expectations and you know Look, you've been here since 2018. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of folks who, you know, zarati has been here since 16. There's been a lot. I mean, there's people who are four, five, six, seven years, right? And it's, you know, it's a unique place that I think a subset of the population just loves working at. And, um, you know, a big part of the series is just trying to expose that culture and that team so that people can listen to it. Like, do, do you really want to be a part of this, right? Because, you know, we'd rather have, I'd rather have a small group of highly motivated and committed people versus a large group of sort of mediocre people. You just can't, you know, you can't, you can't teach motivation. You can't get an employee who's motivated. You, they got to show up, you know, and that's an internal quality that, you know, in my opinion, shows up in you. It shows up in you between seven and 10 as a kid, you know, and you're either, you either got it or you don't, you know, um, so it's good, good, really good. And so. Uh, when employees leave, so let's transition to the negative side, right? So you've, you've either had employees resign on you or you've terminated employees for, for a variety of reasons. So what, what are the qualities or the reasons why employees are leaving? Talk, talk to me about that. I would have to say the ones that don't work out are the ones that don't believe in the process. They don't believe in washing the cars, you know, doing a carpet shampoo, the spiffy way, doing a high volume oil change with a red bin, using safety jacks. The guys that take the shortcuts, like you said, are the guys that take a little bit longer, but they don't have the best scores or they don't have the best track records. If you follow the process, you will be successful. You have once, if they're not coachable, it's never going to work. If they don't have the energy. It's not going. And at the same time, you have to believe in Spiffy. We're successful. We're here. There's a reason why, and it's because of the process. But if they can't follow the process, they will not make it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, again, I, when I see employees who work at Quick Lubes, like Giffy Lube or Valvoline, or they come from dealerships, you know, Ford, Chevy, Chrysler, Mercedes, Porsche, it doesn't matter which one. I'm like, look, you have like this basic knowledge, but we're going to do it a certain way. And you got to sign up for our way. Or don't even come on board because we're not going to, you know, the system is not designed to let you audible and make it up. Like we don't need, we need your, 
hard work and your focus on our process um, because we're mobile and because we have different technology uh, from a standpoint of, you know, we suck oil out. We use these airbag bladder jacks versus jack versus hand jacks, floor jacks. Um, we have our own software and it, and it constrains you in a way for a reason, right? So we can track the services we provide. You know, our customers love, we provide all this accountability, right? We provide timestamps and geostamps and photos and videos and measurements and all kinds of, and we just keep adding more of that. And it's just, it's, it's what differentiates us and it's, and it, and it's how we acquire and win business. And you just have to do the whole process. You can't do part of the process. You can't choose your way to, you know, today and a different way tomorrow. There's so much tracking and supervision of you today um, with our technology that if you're not doing it, we're going to get on your case. And then you're either going to like get tight and follow the procedure or you're not. And we're going to ask you to go somewhere else because it's what we sold the customer and it's, it's what's the safe operations and all that sort of thing. And so, um, it's critical. Okay, good. Um, so tell me what's the best part of your job today, your job as, as regional manager. I would say, and this goes for the, probably the past couple of years is just really working and developing with my team. Yeah, You know, I would say from where my team was two years ago to where they are today, yeah. I have been a part of the growth of several, Chris Marshall, yeah, Damon Ravel in Raleigh, Juan, um, you know, my new supervisor yeah. in Charlotte. It's just, yeah. I had the opportunity. Spiffy gave me the opportunity. Yeah. We're giving other people the opportunity. Yeah. The, the, uh, I'm sure you won't mind me telling the whole world this, but my, most of my coaching to Kevin is like, like, Kevin doesn't need your help. Stop calling him. Go solve. You, you have a whole host of problems in other cities. Leave Kevin alone. <laughs> yeah, he, you've done a great, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chris, Chris Marshall. Yeah. Hey, stop calling Chris. Chris is good. Leave him alone. Like he, he grew up and left the house. He's flying on his own. Let, let the bird fly. <laughs> I think at one point I, I found out you're in Atlanta. I'm like, dude, what are you doing in Atlanta? You don't own that anymore. Well, Chris asked for some help and I thought I'd come down. I'm like, expletive, expletive, get your expletive back to Charlotte. <laughs> I think, but it's, it's, you know, the plus side is it's nice. I think there's uh, an enormous amount of teamwork across the management team, right? And yes, all the folks we talk to have, um, have spoken about that. And, and it's, I think it's a reason that keeps people here. Um, and so that's good. Uh, you know, again, it's funny for you. Like, I think you, they're all like your little brothers and you don't want to like, you always take their phone call and you always come to help them, which, which is, if those are the problems I have, those are good problems to have, I guess. Um, what's the hardest part of your job today? I would say with the current state and the direction that we've really been pushing, I would say, you know, late last year to this year is just getting everybody to understand the big picture. And sometimes the big picture can be the smallest things. It's the van maintenance. It's, you know, gut checking your, your technicians at the end of your shifts. If we can promote our systems, our process, as much as we do, we should promote the, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, our culture, get the culture more out there. Yeah. You know, look, it's a business, but we can help people. We've seen a lot of people grow, but we've seen 18 year old kids that come in here, no job experience. And these guys are monsters at an airport slinging 20, 30 oil changes in a day that they've never touched oil before. But this right. is something that we're impacting them with. They gain our loyalty. Let's keep it up. How can we make those guys better? And if we continue to make those guys better, that means we're going to get better, you know? And it's just, that's the big picture. What are we doing to affect not only tomorrow, but how is this going to affect us next month? How is this going to affect us in July? Sure, it's only May, but we really need to start planning on that. Assets, how many more employees do we have? What's the weather? And we got to stop looking at it as just a day-to-day -day thing. And we really got to start playing on the future. 
Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I think one of the things I'm going to do is a Carl only um, spiffy culture introduction. Well, I think it'll be, it's a good to update it. Uh, I, again, the one that I have for, for training is it's a couple of years old. I, you know, it's, it's tight, but it, I think it's something that it's, it's worthy to redo and sort of use new examples of. Um, interesting. Um, so what questions do you have for me? Anything? Did you see Spiffy being where it is today when you first started? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a short answer and a long answer, but the short answer <laughs> is going to sound arrogant. And I, I think it really needs some, it needs some perspective. Um, uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, I'm surprised that we got there, you know? And so when you start a company, right. Um, you know, you either as an entrepreneur, you're either, um, you know, you're, you're, you know, and no, no dog, no, no, nothing down about an ice cream shop. Like, you know, you buy an ice cream shop, it's doing 300 grand a year. It makes 10% margin. You work there, it makes 30 grand. Like, you know, maybe next year it does 320 grand. Right. And so, and you make $32,000 or something. Right. Um, you know, Scott and I started with a very big vision to create the Amazon of services. Like we saw, you know, so this is back in, you know, so think back to 2010 to 12, really the idea for Spiffy came out around 2011 or 12. We incubated the idea of digital mobile, you know, digital technology enabled mobile services out of the car washes we owned. And then, um, it was like a funny story about how we ended up creating a different company. Um, but we did, and then we launched Spiffy in 2014. And, you know, when you go, when you go raise outside money, like people don't want to invest in small ideas. They want to invest in big ideas. So if you're going to choose to go and create an investable high growth business, you need to have big ideas, right? You know, um, again, no one wants to give you a million dollars to make, to, to build a $10 million business. They want to give you $10 million for a billion dollar business. And, um, uh, you know, so Scott and I, again, we're, you know, we were data driven back then. We're more data driven now. We're like, look, this whole industry is so not modern and it's not modern from the customer side, right? It's not, it's not mobile and convenient, you know, like you got to go to the Jiffy Lube or you got to go to the dealer or you got to go to the car wash. And, and we saw things like Uber and Lyft coming on the market and, and, and we saw people deciding to pay more for convenience. And so, you know, like, look, you know, I mean, the, the automotive industry is like $400 billion. It's like huge. And so look, you know, we get 1% of that industry. That's, you know, 4 billion in revenue. Like that's a pretty big 1% is a lot of this industry. And so we felt like it could be huge. Right. Um, but then you got to like, you know, it's like the elephant you need to start eating, how to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Right. And so, you know, we started our, our first vision was, you know, one, one cost, you know, the initial thesis was we want to, we want to acquire and serve one customer for one car, one service at their home digitally. Uh, and we did that in 2013. Um, and then it started to grow and, you know, again, we're, we're going to do 70 million this year or 70 plus. Uh, and sometimes I'm surprised, like I, I interviewed a couple other people who've been around a long time and they're like, you know, we used to have a goal to do 80,000 a month. And that was like, that was the big, hairy, audacious goal was 80,000 a month, right? We do $80,000 by like 11 AM now, right? Like quite literally, like we're, our days, you know, like a slow day is 200 grand for us, 300 grand, you know? And so. So, you know, and we track this stuff by the hour and the minute. And so like, we look, you know, what time did, you know, when did we get to a hundred? And so, so quite literally it's like by 11 or 12 o'clock we're we've done 80 grand for the day. Um, and back in 2015, like we, we were hoping to get there someday, someday was 80 grand a day. Right. And, and I have this in my notebook, I have this list of goals. It's like a, it's like a printout. It was, it was like 2015, maybe or 16. And. You know, we had a five thousand dollar day, and I was like, "Dude, this is awesome! Like, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, <laughs> this is, we're gonna do a hundred grand this month." You know, and so, um, 
again, we started with really, and this is you know, Scott and I have been partners for over 20 years now. And, um, you know, the thing we're super aligned on is like, life is short and we're going to go play for big wins. Like we're not looking for small, uh, small wins. And that helps us, you know, design the financial s system for the business and the people. And, and we know that it's, you know, it's a 10 to 15 year run to sort of get to a place where, you know, you're big and self-sustaining and maybe we go public or maybe we get acquired or whatever, whatever sort of the, the end state is or the next sort of evolution. Um, and so if you're going to do it for 10 or 15 years, it's got to be big and you want to play for it. And so, uh, so long, long answer. Um, uh, we started with really big goals. Um, I, I do at times and I have sort of like, wow, I'm really surprised we're here. Uh, as I, as I dig through old notebooks and clean out office desks and find some of these things. I, I talked to Addison. He was the first person I interviewed in the series and he has like, you know, he's been around that whole time, right? He's, he started in November of, uh, 2014. And, and so he's, he, and he has like this little library of stuff, which is pretty interesting. He's been keeping it for, uh, for a long time. He's going to share it with me. So, uh, yeah. So again, we, we started with that. Um, we're not, you know, we're not even close to being done. There's a, there's a long, there's a long, long runway in front of us. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time keeping the energy up for like, I gotta, you know, I'm 10 in here. It's spiffy. I got, I got, I got another 10 in me. So we got to keep going. <laughs> we got, you got those little kids. We got to put those little kids here in college. So one of them already works for us. So there we yeah. Go. Yeah. <laughs> We're not opposed to a little, uh, proved nepotism here at spiffy. It's hard, it's hard to find good people. We, we hire brothers and sisters and fathers and uncles and cousins. Oh, this is pretty good. What else? Any other questions for me? Um, I know starting off as a detail, I mean, I remember my interview with you was, it was mostly detail, you mm -hmm. know, 2019 October, I think is when we acquired, um, YLL. November. Did you, was it November? Yep. November. Yeah. Um, it was a good dinner. I'll never forget that dinner. Um, <laughs> there, did you think it was going to get to this point of went from detailing to oil changes? to recon facilities. I've helped open up a recon facility mm -hmm. to Amazon. Yeah. Where else do you think we will end up in the next two years? What other kind yeah. of services do you think we could be completing? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think there's two components of how we think and manage the business that have gotten us here. And one is that you know, we have a customer first culture, right? And so we make decisions around what the customer wants and needs. Customer wants us to change oil at midnight on Christmas Eve. We change oil midnight Christmas Eve and we got to figure that out, right? And then guys like you need to figure out how to make the employee, find employees who want to do that and do it well. So that's number one. And, and the other thing is we have, you know, our strategy and, and people, you know, I used to think strategy was like a big book that teachers created to justify their existence at universities. It was a naive, young, arrogant opinion of mine. And now I, you know, I'm much more uh, appreciative of companies who define their strategy and then they, they you know, they, they really run their business around that. And it's, and it's hugely important. And um, we have this strategy called fleet management as a service, right? So we want to manage fleets um, and, and, and we, want to, we want to do it for the customer. Um, in the most convenient, cost-effective, profitable way possible. And so, um, you know, we had this experience during COVID. So, so that strategy existed during COVID, and we were like cleaning buildings during COVID. If you remember that, we were doing decons yep. of buildings that, you know, somebody comes in, they have COVID, we're going to go disinfect the building. And we did that like for like three months, you know, and it was a COVID survival strategy. We generated six figures of income, like, cleaning buildings yep. in large part because we were pretty aggressive and we had chemicals. Like one of the things that Scott, you know, Scott called me in early February, he's like, Hey, this, did you see this stuff going on in China? Like, what if it comes to the States? What do you think about it? Like literally it was like eight in the morning on a Saturday. And I'm like, dude, I'm like putting my shoes on to go for a bike ride. Like, can I think about it and call you back later? <laughs> 
<laughs> so I come home and and I, you know, so in any case, we we bought a lot of chemicals. We could we could do that. But it came to a point, like if you remember this, like August or September, we started to like bump up against building cleaning companies who had finally gotten out of their way. They got chemicals, they'd figured out how to do stuff. People by that point were pretty straight up, like the world's not gonna end. This is like not good, but like, you know. If you're not like really sick and really old, you're probably not going to die from COVID. That, that's not the doctor's answer. I understand that. But, you know, in April, we had no idea what was going to happen. Like, is this going to be the zombie apocalypse, right? Like there was, <laughs> there was a lot of, right? I mean, there was a lot of very it was. scary sort of uh, news at that time. And no one really knew. Um, and so, again, we were sort of, you know, Scott and I are in conversations like, do we, how do we stay alive personally? And then how do we keep the business going? And so in any case, we decided in August or September, somewhere in there, like, we're not going to compete with these building companies. Uh, we're gonna, just going to go back to, to dealing with automobiles. And, and really, our whole business is around technology-enabled mobile services. And it's the, we want to build, we want to be the Amazon of automotive services, right? We want to digitize and bring convenience and cost-effective pricing to the, you know, the world of convenient cost-effective price services mobily to people who own cars. And that, and that could be you at home as a consumer, or it could be, you know, the largest fleet in the country, you know, it, or it could be uh, the government, right? It could be uh, cars, trucks, box trucks, you know, class one through eight vehicles, whatever it is. And so as we've, you know, we have this strategy and as things come in from the customers, we're, you know, we use our customers to help our grow our services. Right. So we don't, we don't tend to f go to new customers for new services. We tend to, to solve new problems for current customers because they trust us. We're on property. We're solving problems for them already. Um, and that's how, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, we're doing, we're doing some work at, um, you know, we created these reconditioning centers where we're, taking used cars and making them used car saleable, right? New tires, clean them, fix aesthetic defects, uh, make sure they're safe, all those sorts of things. You know, and we didn't, you know, we didn't have that on our roadmap in 2014. Uh, but it makes sense from our strategy standpoint because the customer has to do it, right? And And half that work is, chain you know is oil tires and cleaning and then half of it's mechanical and so we just had to add the, add the mechanical you go hire some trainers and hire some asc mechanics and next thing you know you're you know you're running a service center that's doing you know 400 new cars you know producing 400 cars a month for for a client right and so so i don't see us changing the strategy i mean a fleet management is so so that's how we got here right customer first and fleet management and our strategy of fleet management as a service Going forward, you know, we bought a company uh, called Nuvenair, right? And so now we, we sell chemicals, right? They have their own liquid chemicals. They have, they have uh, I'm going to do it a disservice, but it's basically an all-purpose cleaner that customers like. And so they sell that, and then they have a competitive product to our smart tumbler. And so that whole team exists, and they're selling stuff. Um, and they're going to continue to do that. Uh, and they, they have some um, ideas for innovation over there. We'll see where that goes. Again, those guys don't report into me. I just sort of hear about it tangentially once or twice, you know, every every quarter or so. Um, you know, on the on the headquarters side, you know, we we uh, we build franchises, right? So we have a bunch of franchises out there in the world. What we have found is that um, there's there's interest in franchising for sure. Um, there's equally or more interest in what we would call white label services, right? And so we take the technology and the software that we use to be su successful mobily, which allows us to generate two to three times the revenue per day of, of our competitors. And, and, and we license the software and the technology to customers, right? And so we're doing that in a lot of places today. And I think over the next five years, you're going to see software become a much bigger part of our revenue. Um, you know, right now that's not really, that's not something you sell particularly, I guess, you know, some, somewhere down the road, if you wanted to get out of your regional manager job, that could be a part of the world you, you move over to. Um, and so, but that's, I think, I think the biggest change is you know, five years from now, you know, we're going to be selling tens, if not 
hundreds of millions of dollars a year of software. That would be my prediction. Um, and we're still going to, you know, we're, we're continuing to grow our service business. I mean, the service business is not going anywhere. Um, it's just, uh, as we look at, you know, what does the clients want across the world? And, and, and you know, uh, every dealership in the country wants to go mobile, but they don't want spiffy franchising. They want the guts of our trucks and our software, because that's the secret sauce yeah. that makes us successful that no one, that no one else has today, as far as I know, not, none of our competitors even have it. They have like these cobbled together email scheduling things, but the secret sauce that, you know, allows you to run your business at the, at the profit margin and revenue multiples that you're running it, they don't have that. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's the future Scott and Ryan Ede and Connor are driving. I think that's probably the biggest difference yeah. you're going to see five years from now. And then again, I think your service business is going to get bigger. We're going to service um, more different, more and different types of customers. I think we will uh, put more effort into servicing consumers. We, we service consumers today, but we, we don't really hunt consumers like we hunt fleet. <laughs> they sort of call us and we, we service them very happily. Um, but you were around when we were hunting consumers and looking yes. to like add them <laughs> like herds of cattle. We wanted to, to add them to our ranch. And, uh, I think that'll come back, uh, at some point, uh, we're still, uh, you know, most consumers, uh, I'd say people in the automotive industry don't realize there's still a lot of long tail effects of COVID in our industry, the cost of new cars, the cost of used cars, the convenience components of service, the rise of things like Carvana. Uh, and ACV auctions and the changes in those worlds. And so all that stuff sort of, it's really just starting to get traction now. Um, and so I can see that real, a lot of those trends of digitization and, and convenience really accelerating. And then we're like super well positioned to just, you know, scoop up all the opportunity there. Well, good question. Makes dude. sense. That was, like a ten, that was like a 10 minute. <laughs> <it was> like, <laughs> So warning to con warning to new employees, I can talk a hungry dog off a meat truck. So be careful with the questions <laughs> you ask me, especially when you start talking about Stiffy. I got I got lots of thoughts. I've been here a long time. <laughs> All right, hey, uh, this has been a great time. We've been at it for about an hour. I, I want to thank you for your time. Um, again, my name is Carl Murphy. I'm the president and co-founder at Get Spiffy. I run services uh, operations, and and today we spoke with Kevin Dooley, the regional manager for the Southeast. And uh, you can find career opportunities at getspiffy.com forward slash careers, or you can find us on Indeed, which is our primary recruiting source. So we'd love to, we're always hiring. We're always looking for uh, smiling, motivated, committed people who want to be great. Have a great day. See you guys in the field.